my father, but also my mother, were trained as um, what are they called sleeper agents uh, who would be sent into West Germany and spy for the Soviets. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. In 1978, Ia Verlezinska was a university student in Soviet Latvia with dreams of becoming a writer. She had just spent a heady month in New York visiting her father Iman Slesinskis, a Soviet translator working at the United Nations. However, he was an employee of the KGB and a member of the Communist Party. During her trip to the US, Eva's father informed her that he and his wife Rasma were about to defect. He offered her a blunt choice, take a taxi to the Soviet embassy and denounce him as a traitor or stay with him and never see her mother or her homeland of Latvia again. She chose to stay. The new family officially became East German immigrants with new identities, Peter and Linda Dorn and their daughter Evelyn. They were citizens of nowhere who possessed re-entry permits but no passports. In 1985, soon after Mr. Lezinskis publicly disclosed confidential items on various KGB operations in Latvia, he died under mysterious circumstances. If you'd like to support the podcast, I welcome individual donations or monthly donations to support my work recording these incredible stories. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, I'm Sue Norton and I live in Dublin, Ireland. I love Cold War Conversations because it offers a huge variety of recollections and analysis of the Cold War years in a conversational way. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Eva Lezinska to our Cold War Conversation. I was born in uh, 1958 in uh, Riga, Latvia. At that time, uh, Latvia was occupied by the Soviet Union. And who was in your immediate family? Well, I had a mother and a father, and uh, my mother's mother, my grandmother, uh, lived with us. And what what sort of accommodation were you living in at that time? We were living in uh, in sort of a workers' um, area. I mean, nineteenth century built up uh, area uh, of Riga. And my father had uh, grown up in that house. It was a house uh, that had four apartments and we had a little garden and all that i i really enjoyed it <laughs> but uh, but i guess uh, the adults uh, didn't particularly because it was quite dark and uh, damp and whatever so it sounds like it had quite a lot of character yeah it did <laughs> <laughs> And what what did your mother and father do for employment? My father uh, at the time was uh, working for, well, for a daily newspaper. And, well, anyway, my my parents got uh, divorced when I was uh, six years old, but uh, my father basically stopped living with us when I was about four and a half. So while he was there, he supposedly worked for a daily, but he was also involved with the KGB. And uh, I'm not entirely sure what exactly he did for them at the time. 
Later on, he became the editor-in-chief of a paper that was... uh, whose target audience were Latvians living in exile in Western countries. Then later on, he became chairman of an organization called something like uh, an friendship association with compatriots abroad or some such thing. It was a KGB front organization. My mother... Uh, worked for the Supreme Soviet in the capacity of an editor. She was uh, she had studied um, Russian philology at the university, and uh, that was uh, that was her job. She was never a member of the Communist Party. My father was uh, a communist. Was there any indication at that time that you, your parents were were nationalists or, or thought that Latvia should be independent? <laughs> An interesting question. Well, like I said, my parents got divorced. I don't remember my father saying much uh, political to, to me when I was three and four, but... Um, I grew up with my mother and uh, actually started seeing my father only when I was 10. I mean, so we had sort of a gap of four years at least. And um, my mother was a staunch nationalist. I mean, my mother refused to join the Communist Party my mother, even though she had studied, like I said, she had studied uh, Russian at the university, I was not to watch any Russian television. Um, she always corrected my Latvian. I was not to have much to do with anything Russian or Soviet or or anything like that. And also a very important uh, person in my life was my grandmother, who was born in um, 1891 and uh, who had lived through World War I and World War II. And uh, we would have long conversations at night. Uh, We shared a room, so... That was uh, a perspective on things as well. So, yes, I was raised in a nationalist spirit. So your grandmother had seen Latvian independence up to 1940 then? Yes, yes. And she was not a rich person, Uh, actually had uh, worked for others all her life until the Soviets came in. Uh, She and my grandfather had always wanted to have, well, some land and a a place of their own, but that never came about because of all the political changes. And uh, during World War I, uh, she was, uh, my grandfather was uh, busy, you know, at the front. (laughs) He was drafted. And uh, and my grandmother was a refugee in uh, Russia, and when and then they stayed uh, in Russia for two years. I think after the the war, it was not so easy to get back to Latvia, and um, and they had made some money, and they were gonna buy some land and and start a farm and all of that. And uh, the Russian border guards confiscated everything that they had. So once again, it was uh, all over for them. But I'm saying that, uh, you know, she didn't have any uh, reason to whitewash uh, the period before the Soviets came in, and yet she was no friend of the Soviets. So there was a you know person who'd been poor all her life and still was waxing nostalgic about the time period before 1940. Did you have any relatives in the West or or any any connections with the West at that time? 
no connections, but except uh, for my mother's sister, her older sister, who uh, basically went to Germany early on in the war and got married to a German and who subsequently died. And uh, then she married a former Latvian legionnaire at the end of the war and uh, ended up in Australia. So, yes, I had an Australian aunt who would uh, send uh, uh, usually cards, but but uh, also letters. And uh, these letters were actually sent to my mother's friend, not directly to us. Mainly, I think, uh, as a vestige of the time when my father was living with us. But I don't know. Maybe it was... Um, you know, there was some reason for my mother not to want to to be known as a, you know, as the sister of someone who's living abroad. And uh, well, and my mother also had a brother who was in uh, Latvia in Riga, and uh, who managed not to be drafted uh, during Second world war uh the germans left him alone because my grandfather had said that um you know he is he's his only son he was already an aging man he needed somebody to help him etc cetera, etc cetera. so the germans left him alone and then the russians came in and basically put him in a filtration camp uh because uh it was suspicious that you know he was uh, of the age to be drafted he was born in 1925 and and yet there he was so he spent uh, i think 2 years or so in a, in a, a camp and uh, almost starved to death wow that's an incredible family story you shared there i really appreciate that can you tell me a little bit about your schooling what what was that like growing up I went to a school, uh, it was school number 50, uh, and it was, uh, well, you know, we we studied there from uh, grade first through 11, and it was a specialized English language school. Namely, we uh, learned English from um, the first grade, and... Uh, then uh, after eighth grade, we had to pass exams, and if if you got uh, less than uh, less than a four in the English exam, then you couldn't continue with uh, high school there. I mean, secondary school in British parlance. So, but I stayed there from uh, grade one through eleven. Yes, I was a young pioneer, and uh, foolishly, I also joined the Comsmol because everybody did, but also I had the uh, idea that uh, you could uh, change things from from the inside, which of course turned out not to be the case, and uh, so it was belonging to these organizations was basically just, uh, you know, in name only. Um, I was never active so that they would leave me in peace. Uh, I always volunteered to, uh, to do the, uh, what do you call it? The, the mural newspaper, you know, with poems and drawings and nice lettering and all of that. So, so I would do that usually late at night, listening to Radio Luxembourg, and uh, and that was it. That was the extent of my uh, Compsomol activities. <laughs> I like that. An English language school seems unusual for somewhere in the Soviet Union. Well, it was, uh, yeah, Riga had two of those. Uh, the other one was not supposed to be as... Uh, elite as as the one I went to. And there was a French school and there was a German school. 
So go figure. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I guess the idea was to have, uh, yeah, to have the, to have some sort of an elite, uh, well, I don't know. I, I I really don't want to speculate even why why that was allowed or encouraged or or whether it was uh, some sort of a vestige from previous times. Uh, I don't know. I mean, these schools, yes, they they had been that even uh, in the pre-Soviet period. So, do you think it might have been your father's influence that got you a place there? No, no, not at all. Uh, I remember when uh, my my mother and I would, or my grandmother and I uh, would be passing that building, which was not very far from uh, where we lived. I would say, "Well, this is the school I'm going to go to," and uh, there were all kinds of uh, kids in my school. It was not all just you know children of communists or or. Uh, or writers, artists, uh, whatever. So th- there was this uh, contradiction that we were supposedly this uh, this elite. So one would think that we uh, uh, that there was uh, that we were ideologized heavily, but uh, I would say that it happened less than at other schools, at the uh, so-called average schools. I don't know. We were we were raised for something else, for <laughs> whatever purpose, but uh, we were not actively indoctrinated, really. Uh, it was probably uh, happening by uh, subtler means. Yeah, and I guess it was. It ended up being useful for your later life rather than you going to German school. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> and um, when you're sixteen, your mother tells you some information about your father. Yeah. Yes, uh, she told me in anger that my father was KGB. And uh, she was. Uh, she told me that uh, because she really didn't want me to be seeing him. And uh, at first, she would talk about uh, his uh, problems with alcohol, uh, and uh, always uh, saying that that was the reason why they got divorced his heavy drinking but um but then it suddenly came out that he was KGB and and uh, then of course well now i understand that uh, she didn't want me to get involved with anything like that and um uh, so that may have been her reason in addition to feeling yeah i don't know uh, jealous of that relationship, uh, I don't know. So she was worried that he might try and recruit you? Maybe, or just indoctrinate me or something like that. Uh, even though she also knew, as it turned out, that uh, he had tried to defect uh, to the West uh, in 1960. But actually, both of them, had uh, been planning to defect to the West as early as uh, 19, well, basically in the, uh, after I was born. My parents um, uh, took me to Moscow when I was six months old because my, well, mainly my father, but also my mother uh, were trained as um uh what are they called sleeper agents uh who would be sent into germany um uh, and uh well start out in um in east germany and then um uh, after they're acclimated and their german has improved then um uh, uh, go to West Germany and uh, spy for the 
Soviet. My mother never told me this. And uh, yeah, but their plan had been to to go along with the KGB, but then basically defect, uh, which is what my father then accomplished in 1978. My mother never did. But uh, as I was growing up, I didn't, uh, I mean, I knew that uh, that for some reason we had lived in Moscow for for a number of months, but um, but not uh, why? I mean, not uh, it, supposedly. Uh, it was because my father was being trained as a diplomat and uh, and uh, was uh, going to be posted in Romania and uh, all of that, which of course turned out not to be true at all. But uh, but Moscow, as a fact, was. True. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, that must have been a quite a shock. Lear- learning that, particularly when with the um, the later history here. Yes, and and uh, and I uh, want to add that uh, my mother admitted that she knew of his attempt to defect in 1960. Uh, only, well, basically in the well i don't know 1995 6 whatever because i was not sure that that she knew that i mean my father told me about it but but uh, i didn't know that she knew all along wow wow so you you go on to uh study at university and i think while you're there your father invites you to the USA, where he is a, well, supposedly a Soviet translator at the United Nations. He uh, went there. Well, this is uh, now later knowledge that I have gained. Apparently, the uh, local KGB uh, were the the Latvian branch uh, were beginning to be a little bit suspicious of him while he was still in Latvia, and they would not uh, give him a recommendation for the post at uh, at the United Nations. But uh, my father had very good connections in Moscow, since he was a graduate of the uh, elite uh, school there, the um, Institute for International Relations, and was a star student there, etc., etc., etc. So he had some connections in Moscow, and basically the Moscow KGB overrode what what, uh, the Latvian one thought, and um, and so he went to... uh, work at the United Nations and uh, also do some spying for the Soviets. But uh, then it turned out that uh, that was not the full story and that he had been collaborating with the CIA since 1960 and his uh, attempt to defect. Incredible. Incredible. What what did you think when you got that invite from your father were you excited or were you did did you have to think about it as to whether you wanted to go <laughs> no i didn't have to think about it at all i mean uh, uh soviet a young soviet person uh, uh from latvia getting a chance to go to the united states it was uh, exciting as hell of course i wanted to go but um I had a lot of difficulty going because, uh, well, he sent me the invitation and then you had to go through, uh, well, basically through the various uh, Komsomol outfits. I mean, the at the university, at the regional level, at the all-city level, uh i don't even remember uh all the you know various conversations that i had to have but um 
for some reason, uh, it was always uh, delayed. I mean, we need uh, information from uh, whatever, somewhere in Moscow. Uh, that is not uh, coming. So you will just have to wait. And uh, so one day uh, I had just uh, received my student stipend, which was 40 rubles at the time. And I was passing the um, Aeroflot outfit uh, in the center of Riga near my bus stop. And uh, I think they had maybe some sort of an ad in the window that uh, a ticket to Moscow costs 20 rubles. And I thought, well, what the hell? I'll just go. I'll go to Moscow. I'll go to the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and um and um, you know tell them that that uh, for some reason uh latvia latvia or the latvian communists are not letting me go visit my father and uh, and so i did and i didn't even have a place to stay in moscow and uh, when i went to to the um uh, ministry building and I saw how huge it was and of course I had no connections whatsoever then um, I thought that uh, well this is really silly but on the other hand here I am in Moscow so I found some acquaintance who's uh, whose uh, son or daughter or whoever it was uh, also worked for the United Nations and knew my father. And uh, and so I went to visit that uh, old babushka uh, who uh, said, well, but I don't know anyone at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And yet she made some phone calls and eventually found me a name and that person was willing to meet with me. And I went uh, to him and told him my story of woe that, uh, you know, for some reason I'm not getting the, the necessary documents to get my exit visa. And, um, and he said, Oh, well, okay. Well, uh, it's a good thing that I know about this. Well, we will take care of it. Well, them taking care of it took another. I don't know, six, seven, eight months. But uh, eventually they did. They um, they gave me the visa. Incredible. What did your mother think of you going to the US? Was she fearful that you wouldn't come back? Yes, yes. She was fearful that I would not come back and I couldn't understand why. Of course, uh, now I understand why because of that uh, experience in 1960. <laughs> you know, so she probably did um, suspect that my father was going to defect uh, eventually. I mean, and that, uh, that I may be caught up in all that. And of course, she turned out to be right. But of course, she didn't tell me any of this. And I don't know what uh, would have happened uh, had she told me. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have gone, but maybe I would have. <laughs> hard to yeah. Hard to say. Yeah, it's really difficult to second guess that that sort of stuff. What was your first impression of the United States? <laughs> well, it was nothing like uh, like the movies. Um, it was the first impression was uh, uh, terrible heat because I arrived on um, July 30th, which, of course, is a uh, pretty bad uh, time uh, weather-wise in, in New York City. So I was greeted by my father and my stepmother. And then um, there was this big clunky uh, car that someone drove, neither of them, but some other third person. And, uh, and awful uh, bridges, 
uh, kind of decrepit bridges and and uh, and papers uh, flying about and uh, and everything kind of decrepit and awful. <laughs> and uh, and they lived in uh, Midtown. That also didn't look like anything special, really. I didn't believe all the Soviet propaganda about the United States, but I did believe uh, that uh, basically most Americans uh, carried a gun. So I was a little bit afraid, you know, that, you know, somebody might shoot me. But um, but then we went to to Greenwich Village, and that was a completely different scene, and uh, and it was cozy and nice, and uh, piano bar, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was very nice. And then uh, subsequently, every day I was expected to go somewhere and do something on my own. But uh, in a limited area, well, that was the Soviet requirement that you don't go past uh, this or that street uh, north, uh, east, west, uh, south. And very early on, I just went beyond all these limits because, uh, yeah, well, that's... Just uh, because I wanted adventures and I wanted to see beyond that limited area. And the reason why, uh, as I found out later, the reason why they always wanted me out out of the house, uh, well, basically my stepmother, was because she was uh, quietly packing. And she didn't want me to see that. Packing, you know, to, to for the uh, defection. <laughs> so initially, you you found New York quite disappointing, certainly in that journey from the airport. By the sound of it, well, yeah, that first day. But then I really got to love it. I mean, it was it was wonderful. It was a sense of freedom. I mean, you could go wherever you want. You could uh, people were friendly. They would talk to you, and uh, and uh, I had lots of fun on these uh, lonely walks and. Uh, Oh, I would do all kinds of things. I mean, I I, I met some Jamaicans in, in Central Park and I went on a boat ride with them around Manhattan and, <laughs> and did all kinds of things that I was not supposed to do. And it was great. And I went to all, all the museums that there were, um, you know, like MoMA and, and Guggenheim and... Uh, well, the rest of them, and uh, and just walking around was was wonderful. And then, and then the time was approaching that I should uh, go home, and uh, it was unthinkable that uh, you know you you've gone to the United States and you've spent a month there, and that you would come back without presents for everyone. But I had run out of money. And so I asked my father for some more uh, pocket money. And all of a sudden, uh, no, there is no money. Unfortunately, can't give you any. Uh, Money is tight right now. He started dropping hints like asking me questions uh, of the kind, uh, would you like to study in the United States? And uh, I would say, well, of course, but it's impossible. Well, maybe it's not so impossible. And then um, finally, uh, one day, uh, he popped a question while we were still in New York. Uh, namely, he told me that he and his wife were not going back to the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, would I stay with them? And 
that he, well, he gave me 24 hours to think about it and decide. And I thought about it. And I thought about it long and hard. And uh, I told him that uh, I had to go back. That, uh, you know, I had to take care of my mother, who, well, basically was in ill health. And, uh, well, I had friends there and I had started a life there and uh, it would be kind of, it would not be a good thing to to do that to people, to just suddenly disappear. And uh, he said, well, okay, fine. <laughs> and then... Uh, a couple of days later, uh, he said that, um, you know, you should really ask the Soviets to, to uh, you know, to, to, uh, for permission to, to stay a bit longer because uh, I would like to show you Washington. And, uh, and so, yes, I asked for the permission that the Soviet person was supposed to ask and um, permission was granted um, so uh, my stay was extended by two weeks I think and uh, we took the train to Washington DC and uh, there we checked into uh, to into a hotel in the Watergate uh, complex and I and it was uh, sweet and uh, and I and there was some sort of a uh, well I, I don't know I mean there was a plaque with prices I don't I I I don't know but I I um, saw how much the room cost per night and it was I don't know something like two hundred dollars or some such thing. And that somehow didn't gel with the fact that uh, we were on a budget. We were on a tight budget, and uh, they couldn't give me any money. So I asked my father about that, and uh, he just told me not to worry. We went to fancy restaurants and um, had a great time. And, uh, yeah, the next morning... He asked me again the same question, um, except that now it was that uh, he and his wife uh, were not going back to New York, that they were defecting there and then, and that I had to decide whether I was going to stay with them or if I wanted to go back, as I had said previously, then I should take a taxi to the uh, Soviet embassy and basically renounce my father and uh, and uh, tell them that I'm a good Soviet citizen and I want to return. And, uh, and at that point, uh, to me, it was no longer any kind of a big decision because um uh, doing any of what he was suggesting in order to go back i mean it just was totally unthinkable to me and um so the real choice was uh, do you want to stay in this hotel room with me right now or do you want to take a taxi to the soviet embassy and um, and of course i said uh, i am staying with you and how how did you feel about you know leaving everything behind you know your mother friends and... well ah uh, well see at that at that moment i no longer thought about that because i had already gone through the whole process and uh, and i thought i was going back so so at that second time i i was numb i mean i was just not feeling anything at all it was like a 
like um, some sort of a dreamlike state that I was in. I was not happy. I was not uh, sad. I was not anything. I was kind of outside myself. And only later, I mean, after all the flurry of activity, the, um, you know, meeting the, the, uh, FBI people, the CIA people, the, uh, meeting with the Soviet representatives and telling them that, uh, that we are staying in the United States of our free will and all of that and moving to the safe house. Well, and, only then it it started finally sinking in what had happened and um yeah that uh, that basically i was uh, since it was the height of of the cold war it was clear that i was never going back and uh, i had no idea what would happen to my mother and uh and my friends and uh well it was bad and uh but the worst uh, thing was that there was no one to talk to about that because my father expected me to be happy it was very important for him that i be happy i mean so that's when trouble started between us because um he would say things like when i when i said well that i'm worried about my mother and uh, how she's feeling and uh, and what she's thinking and and uh, all of that he would say things like your mother is a latvian nationalist uh, she she uh, certainly understands that this is a better life for you so all the emotional aspects uh, they were simply not available to him or he he deliberately had uh um muted them or yeah, i don't just know buried them, what to maybe. call it yeah but a long time ago i mean if, if for 20 years you've been uh, you've been fearing for your life and uh, being involved in all these clandestine uh, activities well i guess at some point you uh, you kind of lose the capacity for normal emotion yeah cuz you're essentially living this this double life yeah um and what what happens to you next so basically the official defection happened on uh september 5th 1978 and uh as we were leaving the state department where we had met with the soviets and uh, given up our passports uh my in the car uh my father uh said that uh, that we had to change our names and uh, and our backgrounds uh etc and that he that he was uh, from now on he was going to be peter dorn peter friedrich dorn supposedly a german and uh, my stepmother chose the name of Linda, but she was supposed to be <laughs> the, the daughter of a Yugoslav uh, guerrilla commander. Uh, Brilliant. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she was uh, Linda Yegorov Dorn, and... Uh, and I was given the choice to choose my first name. And since in my English classes I was um, uh, called Eve, uh, I was uh, trying to quickly think of a name. And so I chose Evelyn, uh, since it was at least spelled with, you know, I would, I could. Uh, I would say to people, you know, my name is Evelyn, but you can call me Eve. So that's um, 
that's uh, that was the identity and uh, and of course you were not supposed to tell anyone where you where you are from where you were from and uh, and uh, all of that and and that's again uh, uh, it's one thing when you are um, a double agent who is uh, being interviewed by by the secret services and uh, and basically staying at home day in and day out, and it's quite a different thing when you are twenty years old uh, and you are uh, you've been put in um, in some community college. Uh, and people, I mean, the first question that uh, any American of that age would ask me was, where are you from? <laughs> and, and so had to, you know, develop uh, these quick responses. And, uh, yeah, and, and my father would say, well, if they ask you detailed questions, well, you know that they are KGB. Well, no, they are just boys who are interested in me. Yeah. And how how easy did you find it to adjust to life in the U.S.? Well, I was desperate to adjust to it, uh, just because I didn't want to feel exotic and and have all these questions asked of me. So I um, really worked on my English. Of course, now I have uh, a bad accent uh, from <laughs> being back in Latvia for so long even though I work with English all the time and my, my husband is American. But uh, but still, but I, I did work on, on, the, on the language uh, a lot and uh, I tried to learn all kinds of facts about the United States so that I could participate in conversations, you know, like... Um, with time, I I knew all the references to various comic books and and cartoons and and stuff like that. And uh, the problem was uh, initially the problem was uh, education because uh, the CIA, uh, when they had discussed, I guess, my fate with my father. They had thought that they would send me to an American high school for a year, and then I would get uh, proper documents and then go on to college. But uh, they had changed their minds because I turned out to be much more mature than uh, than they expected, and uh, and so they tried this community college on me uh, so that I would uh, get established and get some sort of. Um, yeah, documents because we made the rounds with with one of the uh, one of these um, people who were assigned to us uh, going to various colleges, and they all wanted uh, some sort of uh, you know documents about high school education and all of this. And of course, none of this was uh, forthcoming. And uh, but uh, but I was uh, extremely unhappy at the community college because uh, it was just laughable. Uh, I mean, in terms of education, it was nothing. Uh, well, it was no education. I mean, I don't. Uh, I felt. Uh, well, I, I just uh, felt so different from everyone there. I mean, everyone felt like they were all 12 or 13 years old, even though they were my age. And uh, and then eventually uh, one uh, former uh, CIA person who had gone to Ohio State University said that she knew the dean of admissions there and that she would talk to him. And um, and then that dean said, uh, well, let her come out to Columbus, Ohio, and uh, 
and uh, let me see what she is like. And uh, and so I did. I I went, uh, met with the dean. He was favorably impressed, and so I became a student there. And I left home, which was what I had been wanting to do for a long time. So, uh, so uh, come March 1979, I was living in a dormitory uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, attending classes and uh, having a different life. I can imagine. What were you studying there? Um, well, I took uh, all kinds of uh, classes, but I was mostly interested in philosophy, and I wanted to uh, learn French. And um, so I was uh, taking, uh, yeah, philosophy, French, uh, political science, things like that, uh, basically liberal education. And then, so I stayed there for, uh, until, well, basically a full year. I went to summer school as well because I didn't want to, to go home and, and, uh, and, uh, be with my father. But, uh, then they relocated from the safe house, uh, to Colorado and, um, uh, I was told that I had to join them there and uh, move to, well, then I became a student at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and they lived in Fort Collins, which is, uh, well, another town in in, in uh, Colorado, but eventually moved back to the East Coast. But uh, I graduated from from the University of Colorado. Was your father worried about, you know, the KGB catching up with him at some point? Did he talk to you about that at all? Well, yeah. I mean, he was uh, – actually, I think that there was uh, – we eventually received information that he had been uh, sentenced to death in uh, absentia for uh, being a traitor to the motherland. Well, I mean, it was uh, um, he had all kinds of reasons to to fear for his life, but. Uh, and of course uh, he uh, he kept repeating that i was you know the weak link in in our three person chain <laughs> and and that um, well he was always afraid that i would um, somehow break down and and go to the soviets or um, something like that but uh, which i never really planned on doing or it wouldn't even occur to me to to do something like that but it was of course difficult to to keep all these secrets and so what i well since i always wanted to be a writer i started inventing stories and uh, and i would uh, you know keep ad libbing about uh, uh, how I had, uh, well, it was difficult to talk about Germany because I had never set foot in Germany, um, even though I supposedly was born in uh, East Berlin, had spent time in West Berlin. Okay, I had gone to school in Moscow, supposedly. Well, I could talk about Moscow. But um, but then I invented an um, ant in in uh, in Latvia, and how I would spend summers with my aunt in Latvia, and so I could at least talk about Latvia a little bit, even though my my father, of course, would have not approved of that. But yeah, well, and did you were you or did you try and make any contact with your mother during this time or not? Oh yes, of course. Yes, I uh 
uh, eventually, well, I mean, the Soviets, um, while they never delivered letters that my father wrote to his father, to my grandfather, uh, or, <clears throat> well, basically, never uh, he never received any mail um, from Latvia. I did. Um, so I think the Soviets, too, were hoping that I was the weak link. Uh, and uh, they shamelessly used my mother and her feelings, uh, and uh, I would... I would get these letters from my mother. She wrote a lot and uh, very long letters uh, in which uh, she took uh, time saying all kinds of bad things about my father and also begging me to come back. And uh, it was hard to read these letters because I couldn't tell how much of it was uh, her own desperation that, uh, you know, maybe we'd never see each other again, and uh, how much it was for, for you know, written for censors and, and, uh, and the KGB. And, uh, of course, I mean, it was, I can't even begin to tell you how, difficult it was to read all that um, because of course I felt guilty but uh, I also couldn't understand how she can um, how she can be telling me to come back I mean certainly she must understand um, what would happen if I went back that I would be used as a as a propaganda uh, puppet, uh, and uh, I mean, I would have no life uh, to speak of. And um, it's just like things were unresolved between me and my father when my father died in 1985. Things were kind of unresolved with my mother, too because um she she was very um cagey about any of these uh, issues i mean the deeper issues uh involving uh me uh living in the states etc i mean it was it was all about her and how much uh how desperate she was and how lonely she was and uh, and um, all of that and she was um, unwilling or unable to to even begin to think um, how it was for me but on the bright side she sent me loads of books and magazines and uh, newspapers. So I was always uh, quite, uh, um, I mean, I kept up with um, things in Latvia. And eventually I also corresponded with uh, my friends. I mean, when, when things were beginning to relax in, uh, in Latvia, I, I did, um, have yeah I, I did exchange lots of letters with friends did that make you homesick at all or were you you know, firmly thinking of the u.s as your home at that point no um i mean yes of course i was homesick but uh, I, I, I also knew that I couldn't go back to Latvia, but uh, I wanted to go to Europe um, because it, it felt so strange to, you know, here I am from Europe, but I have never been anywhere except, uh, well, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, um so i i really really wanted to uh go back to europe and uh when i graduated from 
from uh, the University of Colorado, uh, my uh, French and linguistics professor, whom I really loved, uh, he was um, a student of uh, Noam Chomsky, and um, he wanted me to uh, to go to MIT and and study with Chomsky, and and I told him that uh, no, I want to, you know I want to be as close to Latvia as I possibly could, and that uh, I think I'm going to study at the University of um, uh, Stockholm, and um, and so I did, much to his chagrin. Because um, he felt that you know I should have a future in 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 transformational generative linguistics, but um, but no. <laughs> and you you mentioned earlier that your your father died in 1985. There's somewhat mysterious circumstances around that, aren't there? <clears throat> well. That's what uh, lots of people think that, but uh, he um, he was overweight. He drank and smoked a lot. Uh, he liked to eat well, and um, so it was uh, well. My stepmother thinks uh, that it was a bona fide uh, heart attack. And uh, up until recent times and all these uh, murders and near murders of defectors, uh, it was kind of hard to believe that really the KGB would have got to my father. But... You know, who knows? There was no autopsy. uh, And uh, so nobody will ever know for sure. Yeah, it's it's intriguing because, you know, he'd had a long time as a double agent from the 1960s to the 1980s working for both the CIA and the KGB. Um. That's quite a long period. What do you have? You any idea what sort of secrets he was passing to the CIA? No, I don't. Um, I don't know exactly. But he really was. Uh, he had very good connections, and uh, he traveled a lot. Uh, I mean, he loved to travel, but. Uh, it seems that uh, all these travels around the Soviet Union where he would meet with uh, with the top brass of of the local communist parties etc they were not just tourist trips i mean uh, he did learn things kind of the got some insider information and probably I mean, like I said, I don't know for sure. Even my stepmother doesn't know uh, details because um, my father didn't share them. But, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> the CIA doesn't tell me. But uh, but uh, all they all they say is that um, we can't. Uh, I mean, this was after his death that uh, that the uh, uh, exile Latvian organizations applied to the CIA to um, basically confirm that my father had been an agent and uh, got back this uh, letter that said to the effect that um, we can't confirm or deny that um, that Mr. Lashinskis has been um, working with us. But those of us who knew him, <laughs> knew him as a great Latvian patriot. So, Well, yeah, I guess you've yeah. got to read between the lines there, haven't you? Right, right. As you get into the later 1980s, do you start th- thinking that 
maybe you might be able to visit Latvia? When when do you first sort of think that there might be a chance that things are going to change? Well, I felt that things were changing um, while I was still in the States. I mean, I I knew how to read between the lines and the, even the, you know, the the doors that the, that the uh, perestroika opened they were uh, that was nothing that i had seen in my uh, time in uh, latvia i mean the at least in some of the magazines and newspapers that i was reading and uh, and then when i moved to uh, uh, stockholm which was in 1987 uh basically i was very close to latvia and uh, and the exile community there was um, had all kinds of connections with people in latvia and they were involved in uh, in um, all kinds of activities uh you know helping uh people who were beginning to demand more and more freedom and uh, there were these uh well all kinds of things i mean materials i mean smuggled out of uh, latvia and then uh, printed in sweden and then uh, uh taken back um etc so i i was uh, caught up in all that and when all the demonstrations started uh i was uh writing press releases in english to be disseminated in the west etc 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 and um then people started uh, coming over from latvia uh i think well especially 88 89 and uh so i i got these invitations uh, because you couldn't go to latvia or to the soviet union if you were not invited so i was invited by the popular front and other organizations and the writers union and uh whoever else but um still had to go through the soviets and the soviets denied me the visa and then um but i had always uh, i was saying at that time that uh, you know now i'm not going anywhere else i'm just you know from stockholm i'm going to riga but it didn't uh, work out that way um, the whole process of uh, liberation took longer than uh, than i thought and so in 1990 i went to munich where i worked for radio free europe for four years but uh, but i did get to go to latvia in um, 91 uh, for the first time uh, it was about a week after the august coup Wow. And what was it like seeing your mother after all those years? Well, my mother had come to visit me in um, in Sweden in 88. And, uh, well, yeah, and then later she came, I think, in early 92 or, or was it 91? That she also uh, came and visit, uh, visited me in uh, Munich. But... Um, well, seeing my mother uh, for the first time in uh, in eighty eight in uh, Stockholm was uh, strange, but um, in the sense that I realized that um, I had so much power over her. You know, she she had been this uh dominating uh towering figure uh when i was growing up in latvia and it turns out that uh, she was not particularly tall that she was kind of fragile 
and all that. Um, but when I came, uh, when I went to Riga for the first time, I just felt great. I mean, I didn't, uh, I mean, everyone was uh, worried, you know, that I would uh, feel somehow disappointed or or whatever but i i felt like i could breathe for the first time in in years uh, and plus uh, it was so exciting i mean things were happening and uh, and changing and uh, uh, it was an exciting time to be alive and it seemed like the world was going to be a better place of course uh, that didn't quite work out, but um, but these uh, first years, I would say, um, well, certainly up until the time that Latvia joined uh, uh, the EU and uh, NATO, it was uh, an ex- exciting time. Absolutely, absolutely, it it did seem like the world was. Uh was going to be a better place we were all going to be friends again but yeah as you say it didn't necessarily yeah. work out that way what what was it like meeting your latvian friends uh again was that a a really great occasion for you did they come and visit or was it in 1991 well some people had come to visit me both in stockholm and in munich but uh I I haven't quite been able to figure out why there is maybe one friend only from, uh, as I call it, my first life, uh, who is still my friend. Uh, all the rest of my friends are new friends. And... Uh, I don't know. It was, it was not me. It was for them. It was for some reason difficult to, um, to communicate with me. I I don't know. I don't know exactly what it was, uh, or is, but, um, I, I mean, there are, some people, especially one friend who who wrote to me often um, after my father died, I mean, for two years uh, or, or three or even more, we corresponded uh, intensely, I mean, all the time. And when I started going to Riga, all of a sudden she she was kind of avoiding me and uh, and at first she would uh, say things like oh you know it's so hard to to get uh, get uh, things to eat and drink and uh, um that that you are used to and i would say well it's not important to me at all uh, you know we can drink vodka if <laughs> <laughs> and, and just eat bread uh, but uh, there's something else and and then of course i discovered that um that she had had some kgb connection uh so there is an explanation of why she she was avoiding me but uh, but others i don't know i guess our lives were just uh, took different courses you know, different courses and, and, um, I don't know what the, what the reason is. Yeah. Things change. You move on, they move on and yeah, yeah, I the guess. paths move away, I guess. Um, yeah. so you, your story has been made into a film. Can you uh, tell me about the film? <laughs> well, it was yeah uh the story was actually the the origin of the story is um a, well by now he's no longer a young man um by the name of ben smith who was then a correspondent of uh 
uh, Wall Street Journal in uh, in Eastern Europe, and uh, he contacted me for I don't neither of us really remembers for what reason, but we started talking, and um, and he got really interested in my story, and he. Uh, wrote about me for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, this article was later republished in an Estonian paper, and a movie director saw it and got interested in it. (laughs) And uh, since he knew one of my best uh, friends, who is also a movie director... Uh, they kind of started talking and uh, decided on this project. But for the longest time, uh, I kept asking them, what is the story about? Because we would we would go around and interview all kinds of people, and uh, uh, there would be all these episodes where they uh, want me to do this, uh, talk about this, talk about that. And um, only, uh, I think it was four years that uh, it took to for them to put the movie together. Um, you know, after four years, I again ask them, what is the movie about? And they say, oh, it's about you. <laughs> but I didn't even, uh, I thought it was about my father or uh something uh, something else so i don't know i mean i um then i th- said um the only thing that uh, okay you can do whatever you want but uh, what i don't want to be in this movie is uh, is uh, a victim because uh, basically i like to feel that uh you know i i make my own choices and uh and whatever happens i'm responsible for it and so they promised me that and um, i still think that it's kind of it's a tearjerker at times uh, but um but uh, i don't know i mean it's their movie it's for me it's <sighs> it's in the past i it's not my life i mean it doesn't define my life anymore and uh and i like to think that um i'm more than my biography and and actually well let's say 10 years of my life or so yeah no i can understand that i can understand that so what are you what are you up to now when I came back to Latvia, I mean, when I moved back to Latvia in 1994, it was because um, a new and very exciting magazine offered me to be one of the editors there. So I spent about 10 years um, as a journalist and a writer and uh but uh, now I'm mostly doing translating. I translate uh, books from English to Latvian, sometimes from Swedish to Latvian. I translate poetry. I have uh, a couple, a couple, three maybe um, poetry books. Uh, I mean. Latvian poetry translated to English that have come out in the UK. And uh, yeah, that's what I mostly do, uh, translate and sometimes write, but uh, not as often as I'd like. Yeah, I've always I've always wanted to write. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'm 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 the writer, but uh... I do enjoy making a podcast now, so uh, that, that's sort of my, my, my existence. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. 
You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.